All right, everyone. Well, sorry for the uh, delayed start, but we're ready to get started now. Uh, as always, we really appreciate you being here for Episode 10 of Season 2 of Line Change with Coach Ryan Michael. Our guests tonight, we've got two very special ones, Dylan Denemy and uh, Equipment Manager slash Emergency Backup Goaltender Evan Watts. If you would, please give a round of applause for these two. I'm going to get to you guys in just a second. Uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, talk to Coach Michael here about the previous series that we had against Fayetteville. Uh, a very strong opponent this season, Coach, the Fayetteville Marksman. Uh, a very improved team this year. The Mayhem kept the point streak going on Friday night, but unfortunately couldn't extend it any further on Saturday. What did you see as uh, some of the biggest learning points from this past weekend? Um, well, like you said, they're a really good team. Uh, depth, you know, up front and in their decor is, is pretty high. So um, Friday, for the most part, you know, I thought the keys were slowing the game down. They want to play up up tempo they're they're quick in the sense that you know their forwards and d are both fast individually but they play very fast they transition really well so it was important that we slowed them down you know on their breakouts and in the neutral zone and force them into a slower sort of game i thought you know friday we did that pretty well and as a result we were there in the end um just getting the one point and then saturday uh you know the second half of that game we we kind of got away from that and they you know, they got to the game they wanted to get to in, in the sense that, you know, we didn't disrupt them enough in breakouts and in neutral zone regroups, and that's why it was almost wave after wave of, of offense for them uh, that second half. So, Yeah, it was. Certainly it felt that way in the third period following a, a sharp angle goal from, uh, from Brian Bowen, and things sort of uh, snowballed a little bit from there. But in terms of preparation for you as, as a coach, does it make it easier uh, knowing that you're going right back up there you know, six days later to take them on in their own building? Um, yeah, I think so. It, I mean, your team is, is a little bit accustomed to what type of game they like to play and, you know, what's important in terms of your end and, and the things you need to do to have success. And, um, you know, for us, it's we're going to have film, you know, tomorrow to not only look at some of the things we, we didn't do maybe Saturday, but some of the things they did Saturday that we can, you know, counteract or some things we need to do better so um, I think so everybody you know seeing them for two games everyone gets acclimated kind of with their personnel and, and kind of the way they want to play so it makes it almost a little easier to, to kind of figure out the way you want to match it. So Dylan first off welcome back to Macon we're all very thrilled to have you back here. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on a very successful return to Macon. A uh, goal and an assist, a primary assist, a shorthanded goal. Uh, by the way, our first shorthanded goal of the season. So a very uh, strong return to action for you. You don't have a game like that without uh, without a good degree of confidence. So my question to you is, uh, having not played in a game previous to that um, for really the past season, uh, how did you generate that level of confidence going into a, an important game like that on Friday night? Um. I just really don't think it's that hard to get up for a game, uh, seeing as you haven't played in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, the game's really based, it's, it's an emotional game, right? And um, I don't know, I was super excited, and um, I, my nerves were, were going, but um, just playing with the guys before and getting a couple of skates in practice, um, I just I felt great going into Friday. I uh, wish I could have brought the same energy Saturday. Um, but yeah, I, uh, honestly, Friday just I felt awesome, and it was I was just super excited to get back and, and play. So, what were the the primary factors, I guess, that compelled you to come back to Macon and play for the Mayhem again? Um, well, I honestly wasn't going to uh, I wasn't going to play this year. Um, just with uh, of what most fans know, and most of the guys on the team know, with what um, my family's kind of been through with my dad and. Uh, having cancer and whatnot um he's actually got a clean bill of health right now so so yeah um so with that i was like i gotta i'm i'm going back to play if if you're good pops then uh then i'm i'm heading out and he was he was okay with that my parents are really supportive so 
So yeah, it w worked out pretty much. Absolutely. Well, great news on both fronts then, yeah. and uh, we'll be sure to keep Mr. Denemy in our thoughts and prayers. Um, now, Evan, this next question I want to ask to you. You grew up playing the position of goaltender, but had you ever suited up as an emergency backup goaltender before? Um, I had filled in for a couple practices in the East Coast League with the uh, Kalamazoo Wings, but mm -hmm. uh, never, never played as an emergency backup before. When was the last time you had suited up in full goalie gear? Uh, it had been about six months. Okay, six months. That's got to be a record probably for an e-bug, I would imagine. <laughs> um, so how were you able to manage all the equipment? Because you were still the equipment manager for that night when you were the backup goaltender. How did you manage all the equipment on the bench while simultaneously dressed head-to-toe in goalie pads? Um, I kind of had it thought out in my head what I was going to do, and I really just wanted to make it so that Mike's and the players didn't have to worry about having an emerge like a backup goalie but also they still got their skates sharpened um i had just put flooring down in my room so i could <laughs> just run over uh we'd get off for the period if somebody told me hey i need to sharpen i'd just take my shoulder pads off grab their skates run over to my room and do them half dressed a jack of all trades i guess you can say coach have you ever seen something like that player as a coach no in my time no but i mean <laughs> I didn't maybe give him enough credit, but he really kind of saved the day. So, <laughs> thank you, Evan. Yeah, the, uh, the superhero on Marvel Night. Um, so speaking of, the, the next question I wanted to ask you guys was about the jersey auction. Um, Evan, I heard you got to keep yours. Is that correct? Yes. Well, fittingly so. Um, Dylan, how did yours do in the uh, jersey auction after the game was over? Uh, really good, actually. It's good to yeah. hear. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, that's all the questions I have for these gentlemen. The next uh, part of the show will belong to you guys. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments, uh, concerns, complaints, the floor is yours. As always, the only rule that we have is that uh, you please do so into this uh, crowd mic here that Sean O'Brien's coming to pick up for us. Appreciate that, Sean. Um, just so that we can get all this show archived on our, uh, on our YouTube channel later on. So. So as my husband and I are new to liking coffee, I guess, and following <clears throat> the team, what is the purpose of all the meet and greets? Is that uh, to all four of us? Or? It's to whoever knows the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that question would probably be best directed to uh, either our corporate relations director or our community relations director, but uh, I'll do my best to answer for them. Um, the purpose of the meet and greets is we want to make sure that we're being as integrated in the community as possible. Um, we found really that at all levels of professional hockey, the more immersed you are in the community, the better supported you are um, in the arena, um, the more supported you are off the ice. And, you know, we're just we're trying to make a name for ourselves and make sure that we're getting our logo and our presence out there in the in the central Georgia community. And I guess kind of leading into that question would be more, what about the guys? Like they are, from what I've learned this year, a lot of them are extremely shy. And so it's kind of like awkward turtle meets um, sixth grade first dance kind of thing. Um, nobody knows what to say. Nobody <laughs> knows, should I talk to them? Are they going to talk to me? Um, and so it's kind of... I would imagine it's tough for the guys on top of we're not doing so hot. The guys don't know each other. So why can't we do some meet and greets with the guys and let them get to know each other instead of fans? Well, um, I mean, Coach, we do have meet and greets just with the guys. I mean, what would that? What would the closest thing to that be, really, in your eyes? Well, I mean, the Booster Club every month or so, I, I want to say, does you know outings with the team. I think they were you guys did paintball recently. Um, so I mean, they we do team bonding things, and then just the natural having practice every day and workouts yeah. and whatnot. So okay, that was just my question. Okay. All right, I'll uh, take a w uh, whack at one here. Um, so uh, for Evan, uh, your responsibilities as equipment manager are 
for the most part, kind of unseen by the fans and uh, for a lot of us. And I was kind of curious if you could explain like some of the things that you're responsible for on game day besides just you know making sure everything's set out and skates are sharp and stuff like that, because I know there's more to it than that. So on a general game day, um, I'm normally at the rink right about 8 a.m. Um, I'll normally make sure all the laundry's set, um, sharpen any leftover skates, uh, hang out uh, like morning skate jerseys, socks, uh, and then I'll go set like water bottles out, the coach's board, uh, the clock, and everything out on the bench for practice. Um, about that time, players are arriving, and just, you know, I try to have everything done before they get there so that anything, um, any repairs or anything they bring to my attention, I can get taken care of. Um, and, you know, starting the coffee. Um, like, we just had a player uh, that brought his skate to me, and it was missing a couple rivets, so just take care of that. Um, while they're on the ice, I'll pull, you know, their hangers out of their stalls, and I'll start prepping the visitor side with our trainer um, so that when the visitors get there about 4 o'clock, everything's set, and I almost don't have to go back over there unless there's something special they need. So I'll normally get maybe, you know, an hour or so between our morning skate and our uh, the time that the players have to arrive to be there for the game to, you know, run home, shower, get ready, get right back to the rink. Yes. Welcome back, Dylan. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, this is for the coach. I mean, and the players, too, just probably chime in. Um, how, as a coach, do you keep the morale of the team? Like, I guess I kind of compare the games kind of like the field day because I'm a teacher. So when we lose, of course, tug of war, you know, it's a big detrimental blow to us. Fourth graders and move around. And, of course, I'm in the classroom like, guys, just game, come on pumping them up, and then we go and play other games. How do you, as a coach, keep the morale of the team up and keep them positive and wanting to play? Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. Um, that's a good question. I think it kind of, for me, depends on how the games went in the sense that you know, we could always play well and still lose. I think there's, I don't want to say a right way to lose, but there's, there's times where we lose where I can live with it in the sense that, you know, we played well and either things didn't go our way or I could have been better in an area. But um, I've started doing a little bit more small area games to start practice and, you know, more competition things in the sense of instead of just doing drills that are too repetitive or just for a better – lack of a better term, back skating them when they're just going up and back the whole time. Um, you know, trying to find ways of being creative to get the conditioning or to get the discipline that I need without, you know, sucking out the passion for the game. Um, you know, for some examples, when I do small area games at the end, like the loser will have to do something funny like we've done. Um, Let it go. We've done pairs figure skating where – the winning team will pick two players off the losing team, and they have a couple minutes to come up with like a figure skating routine, and we play music in the rink. Um, I did, when did I do it? The other day? I did yeah, Jesus, Jesus walks, walks the other day, where the guys, nobody, the winning team was going to, or the losing team was going to do it, but nobody scored. It, was, it ended up being a tie, so everybody had to take their skates off and walk off the ice barefoot. So um, just trying to do these little small ways of, you know, playing a game, making something on the line for it and making it, you know, not just going up and back a hundred times, but making it funny just to, to lighten the mood a little bit. All right. So you know how they always say everybody's got a, a teacher's always got a teacher's pet. All right. Mine this year is called Squeaks. He's a kid. Funny. First, I think third day I gave him a nickname. Do you have a coach's pet? <laughs> I really shouldn't. I don't. I'm not saying. And in my in my <laughs> eyes, like I, I would say I don't. But 
you know, I may be biased in, in some areas, and maybe that's something that's not a good thing. Um, I try not to be, but so I'm not going to name anybody because I don't. My answer is no, I don't have one. Coach, uh, what's the main thing that you're going to work on with the team that they need to improve going into this weekend's game? Um, well, unfortunately, the only ice we had this week was Monday. Um, there's like state wrestling championships, so we don't have any ice. So I'm going to, you know, take advantage of our film session tomorrow to show. Um, and, and for me, it's our play away from the puck. And I've said it to these guys before. I think we got to do, especially against Fayetteville, just with the skill and speed that they play with, we have to make life difficult for them all over the ice in the sense of maybe not running guys through the wall, but being physically in people's ways and making them give up the puck and making the game a lot of whistles and you know not a lot of flow, not a lot of rhythm for them to get in. Um, and... I think that'll help. I think we just need to support the puck better. They're, they're fast, again, like I've said, in the sense that they play fast with the puck, but then when they don't have it, like they're right in our face all the time, and it made it difficult for us on Saturday to, to put multiple passes together because we just didn't get to spots to get the puck quick enough. So um, unfortunately, with no ice, it makes it difficult to physically work on things. But... Um, you know, I'm just going to try to take advantage of, of film tomorrow in the sense of showing showing some areas we got to be better in. I think some guys would like it more than others. Um, she was not wrong in saying we have some some shy guys. So, um, but I, I mean, I'm all for it. I think it'd be funny as long as I'm not up there. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you guys don't have ice, like this week, mm. did you ever think about maybe going out into the parking lot and hitting a rubber ball around? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were looking to possibly do that. Um, my last year playing a similar situation. I mean, this happens quite a few times during the year where we, where we don't have ice. So um, I think my last year playing here, we used the uh, – not the banquet halls, but the, the rooms behind the rink, like in like uh, between the Marriott and the rink. And we, we played some floor hockey uh, when Kevin Kerr was still here. It was fun, you know, good sweat. He was two-handing everybody who wasn't wearing equipment, so um, that wasn't fun. But uh, we kind of just ran out of time this week to do something like that. I was thinking about doing it in the parking lot, but that kind of chews up. Uh, everybody's sticks a little bit and kind of is going to lead to more broken sticks. So um, kind of didn't work out this week. So, you know, what I we're trying to do is either do yoga and spin, you know, for the physical activity side of it and then mentally, you know, doing film just to, to get guys watching their shifts and the mistakes, the pluses and the minuses. So I feel like there's been quite a few um, like game day signings this year. Um, so, Coach, what is your method of kind of doing a crash course of your systems and your coaching style and how the, how the team plays? Yeah, I mean, it's um, a tough part about our kind of roster construction in this league is you get these situations where – there's last second call ups or or injuries that, you know, come up and you're kinda you know, we're in middle Georgia where it's not like there's hundreds of players around you. So it, it makes it a little bit difficult, which is it's nice to have Columbus in, in the league below us just because it's it makes it easier to get guys. But um, you know, for guys like Chamelo or, or Pulowski, um, who kinda come in the day of, it's more just what's the most critical I feel like I don't really worry about offensive zone play because I think that's more instinctual and um, being creative so it's usually just you know our D zone coverage is neutral zone and then kind of set set breakouts and then 
I usually try to finish those little powwows with, you know, just playing with your instincts and, and, you know, being creative and not really thinking too much. I think guys play slower and a little bit less effective when you're, you know, constantly analyzing the play and trying to remember, oh, I'm supposed to be here in this situation or here in that situation. So it's kind of just giving them a rough framework of what I'm looking for and then just letting them, you know, be creative and make, make plays off of that. My question is for Dylan. Uh, you played a season in France. Uh, what about playing overseas drew you there, and what was the experience like playing over in Europe compared to playing over here in the States? Um, well, you always want to move up um, as a player. Like Ever since I started, I always wanted to try to play at the best level I could, and it was it is a top league over there. So um, I knew... Uh, I could definitely improve my game playing over there, obviously get more uh, exposure. So, um, and they, they do play on a big, uh, a lot bigger ice surface. Um, so that was a, that was a big adjustment. But other than that, um, just like the travel, the, the culture, it was, it was pretty cool getting to experience um, a different country's like culture and, and, take a little bit of the language in I mean I'm, I don't speak fluent French but um, it was cool to have teammates from like um, all over France uh, Slovakia Czech Republic Slovenia so that was uh, that was pretty cool here's one that's fresh for the coach then for the players Anybody that's looking at the schedule going ahead knows that we have a tough road schedule ahead. I think two-thirds of the games are on the road. Looking in the past, we haven't really had the best winning streak on the road. I don't think we've won one in regulation right. on the road. Right. So how do you mentally prepare for that? Because it's more time on the bus, more time on, you know, not, not your home ice, more time in front of opposing fans. So how do you as a coach get the players ready for that? And then for the players, how do you, how do you prepare for that? Um, I like... I like road games, uh, to be honest with you. Um, you know, even as a player, I think it's a little bit more enjoyable when you go somewhere else, and um, especially some buildings that do really well attendance-wise, and the atmosphere is good, and you can kind of you know keep them quiet and, and win those games. Um, you know, I think a lesson that we need to learn as a group, just with some of the younger guys, is like it's it's almost you have to simplify. Just like when we're at home, you know, there's a, a little bit higher of an energy level, you know, based off the crowd and, and playing at home. Um, you know, every everybody else we play on the road is, has that same feeling. So, you know, when when those things happen, it's it's kind of about surviving the first five minutes because um, most teams are going to be, you know, on their toes. And I think it's just simplifying our game. Um, you have to get pucks in, and you have to get pucks out of your zone in the in the first try and. Um, the more we complicate things on the road, I think that's when we get in trouble, and that's when you know we have those stretches of, of five whatever minutes of, of not great hockey that kind of will cost us games eventually. Um, so I think, again, the message is just you have to be simple. No shots, a bad shot. You have to go to the net. You have to get the puck out the first time and, and play good defensively. And um, you know, The sooner we kind of embrace that mentality on the road, I think we'll start to kind of get you know, better results. Uh, yeah, same thing for me. Um, I actually love playing on the road. I just like the, the routine. Um, it's just like the simplicity of the routine, I, I, like, I, I really enjoy that. Um, I just think as far as I haven't been here for any road games yet, and just speaking to a couple of the guys, I just think it comes down to maybe some guys don't know uh, how to be like how to be a full-time pro, I guess you could say, like, we need to prepare the same way you do at home on the road. Like, it should be no different. Um, I just think if, if all the guys buy in and everybody prepares and take, start taking road games more seriously, like, because like I said, I love playing on the road. You go into another team's rank and you beat them, there's no, really no better feeling to silence the crowd. So I think moving forward, if as a team we just all buy in and and everybody puts the effort they do in at home on the road, I think we'll be just fine moving forward. Um. 
Well, um, my, <laughs> my, uh, I like being on the road too, sometimes just because of the, you know, ease of not having to try to turn around. Because when, when you have a visiting team at your rink, uh, especially for like a two gamer like Fayetteville was, uh, I'm responsible for our laundry and their laundry. So, you know, most nights on home weekends, I'll be there till three, four in the morning. Um, but being on the road, there's kind of that. I can actually, you know, go back with the team, relax after a game. But uh, definitely just team-wise, I think it's we just got to get a system in place and get, you know, everybody on the same page. And very much um, I can sense when we feed off our crowd, I think we need to feed off other crowds, you know, silencing them or they're just their hatred for us. Uh, I think if we can get that adrenaline and, you know, feed off of the visiting crowds um, that, uh, especially lately, we've been doing so much better on the road, I think, you know, it's just another step, maybe another two steps, and, uh, you know, we'll be able to take care of business on the road. This one's for the players. Do you guys ever go into other arenas where they have their own loud crowd hecklers like we do um from what i remember um knoxville has some pretty brutal ones um uh where else um peoria definitely has some uh some interesting characters there Uh, um (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, it's you find it in every rink. It's it's no different than than our fans, um, and it's I, I actually love it. Like, um, especially if you make a big play, and then you just they you hear them. Well, you don't hear them anymore, and that's the best part. So, uh, Roanoke, I would say they have a nice group of people that sit right behind our bench. It's just like slightly above my head. And every time my water bottle gets up there, it takes about two or three minutes to fall at my feet because they're just spla- like smashing the glass right behind the bench the entire game. So, <laughs> It's a little annoying. Well, yeah, <laughs> for me it is. Uh, so my question is from Mike's. Um, Fayetteville scored shorthanded, making it seven shorthanded. We've given up halfway point this season. In the entire regular season last year, the Mayhem gave up six. Uh, so my question is, do you see these shorthanded goals as just a weird fluke that's happening or something that's an error that definitely needs to be addressed? It's not a fluke, no. I mean, for me, it's um, we get too complacent on the power play. It's, and I said that, you know, I think after the second on Saturday, after that had happened, it's just, you know, we – we have this mindset that just because we have the extra guy, we get to work a little less hard, and it's the exact opposite. So, um, you know, that's why in the third, when we got that next one, I sent, you know, the one unit out, and then the next unit out, I just sent five guys. So, you know, my methods going forward is just who's willing, you know, who's going to work harder. Like, I don't need necessarily my quote-unquote skill guys if they're not going to work. So, um yeah, I, I that drives me nuts, to be honest. I think it's, again, sometimes it's a little too casual, and then we just don't value the puck enough. We, you know, we work so hard to get it and get it in their zone and set it up. We just don't don't take care of it. It's a little too careless. I can, I can add to that. Um, uh, I think it just comes down to taking pride. Um, power plays, a power play can make or break your season. Okay, it can put a bad team... If you have a really good pe- power play, you can end up in a playoff spot. A good team, it can bump you down a couple notches. And I just think we need to take pride and and work, like Mike said, working just as hard as we do five on five when we have this uh, man advantage. And I think if we do that moving forward, again, we're going to see our numbers bump up, and we won't see shorthanded goals scored against us anymore. Okay, I got a question. Now I know we do shift changes during the game. So I see Dylan's already laughing. Do you guys practice how fast you get in and out of the box? Because it seems recently that we will have the 
puck in our zone, and all of a sudden it's going in, like, it's weird. There will be one player, and then the rest are going for a shift change. Is there a timing issue, or is it just they need to see dive over the box? It's and kind of dive in? multiple things. Um, the end result is what you said of, you know, we're in our end and we get it out, and then one guy's going to pursue the puck, and then everybody else is changing, but that stems from spending too much time in our zone. Um, you know, when we don't defend quick enough and we're kind of running around in our zone for 30, 40 seconds, it's tiring. Um, physically, and it's, I mean, you can ask any guy that ever played hockey, it's a lot more fun and you never get as tired in the O zone as you do when you don't have the puck and you're defending. So um, it's multiple things. Our shifts are too long in general, I think, in my opinion. Um, and I've expressed some of that. And then when we defend too long, those situations come up because we're so tired. By the time we get it, you know, we really don't have the opportunity to go, you know, play offense. We got to chip it out and go change. So that's kind of the end result of defending too much. No, it's Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, you're good. All right. Does that affect the passing? Because I've seen some of the guys during warm-up, mm. they have beautiful passes. They have beautiful slap shots, backhand, beautiful. During the game, it's kind of like they send a beautiful pass and nobody's there. Yeah. But I mean, yet it was a good pass mm. or it hits and they're not um, – Josh Keplinger taught us at Hockey 101, like you kind of catch it like it's an egg. Yeah. It's like they stop it and it bounces instead of actually, like, pulling it back and catching it. So is that, like, practice or is it just because they're, it's like, excited? Or? For me, it's – A lot of it's ice. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. But uh, for me, it's mental. It's mental. So um, when you get physically tired, you start getting mentally lax and you're a little less sharp in the sense that – you don't know, maybe bear down of I got to make this you know perfect pass or I got to make sure I catch this or um, so like those the situations of one guy going and four guys changing and those passes are almost interlocked because we defend for a minute in our zone and then we finally get the puck and everybody's tired so when I'm tired I'm less likely to make a better pass to Dylan here and when Dylan's tired he's a little bit less likely to catch that pass so I think those are very much intertwined things. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. It, well, I know, right? Um, it seems, okay. <laughs> well, I don't want to fit anyway. Um, recently, in the past, let's see, yeah, we've got players, I guess maybe it's an, an issue, each player's got its own zone, correct, where they're supposed to be. How is it that we've got two players that end up in the same zone but parallel skating, fighting over the puck, and we're in the same jersey. And it ends up being turned over to the opposite team because it's kind of like one person has the puck here, this person comes over here, I guess because this player was supposed to pass it and didn't do it quick enough, and then all of a sudden in the mix-up here, we're slamming into each other and the puck gets turned over to the opposite team. Is that just timing Uh, issue? No, I mean, it's... To a certain extent, like hockey's, you have systems, you have areas on the ice where you're supposed to do specific things, but to be honest, at the end of the day, it's about um, making plays and reading the play um, and, and making the play in front of you. So I can tell this person that you're supposed to be here on this situation, but to be honest, every every rush, every neutral zone coverage, every regroup, every ozone uh, entry, everything's different. Hockey is no static one. It's not football. You know what I mean? Where it's you got one play and this is what we're doing. Like it's every play is always evolving in different ways. And at some point, you know, I can't tell you what to do it's too fast the game's way too fast for me to say you got to be here all the time every time so like i have rough areas where people are supposed to be but um at the end of the day you have to um 
kind of read the play, read off each other, communicate, and then make the play that's in front of you. That's okay. No worries. You're good. Um, I know that after talking with, like, <clears throat> for instance, Alex that came from Quad City, he had mentioned that, you know, a lot of the guys that come here to play, like, the biggest thing that they hate about coming to Macon is how hard our guys hit. We traveled after Christmas and did some. We don't hit like we hit at home at away games. Why is that? I think that's a lot of you know, what we just discussed, talking about kind of the, the struggles on the road. I don't think, um, I don't want to say the effort's not there, because that's, you know, I don't think that's correct. I just don't think we mentally sometimes understand what it the takes confidence. to win on the road. Because it's, it's hard. It's not yeah. easy. It, yeah. it, um, again, every every time we play at home, we've got that little extra juice just from the crowd and, and whatnot, and every time we play somebody else on the road, it's it's the exact same way for them, so we have to we have to, you know, um, elevate our game, and you know, the way I want to play is, and I think we're at our best, is when we forecheck teams hard, we create a bunch of turnovers when we do it right, and that was, you know, maybe well exemplified this weekend. On Friday, we did a pretty good job of that for the most part. We kept the score close. You know, the, the game was a little, not, I'm going to say choppy, but it was a little bit less rhythm and flow for them. And then Saturday, that second half, we didn't, we weren't as physical. So um, that's just, you know, commitment to making life hard for the other team. Yeah. Kind of feeding off of Lydia's question, um, Are there certain guys that you would rather shoot to try to get the goal, or can anybody on the team, if given the opportunity, shoot? I noticed on a few occasions this weekend there was a completely open net, completely beautiful opportunity for a certain player to shoot, and he just kind of stood there like he was lost his last year's Easter egg. Um, no, everybody can shoot. There's no, there's no rules against who can shoot. Um, I mean, we looking at the film, we had some chances. Um, offensively, for me, I think our biggest deficiency is sometimes we take too rushed of shots from the outside instead of, um, like, if you see a lot of teams, like Fayetteville did it quite a bit this weekend where they came over our blue line and they didn't shoot right away. They would kind of delay and hold on to the puck and wait for their guys to kind of come up into the zone and make the next pass, we have to implement a bit of that in our game because I think, you know, some nights we have, you know, 40 shots and it looks great, but if you were to look at, you know, where those shots were placed around the rink, some of them are, too many of them are from the outside. So, but no, anybody, anybody can shoot. All right, so she, Audrey, talked about the shooting. Now I'm talking about the hitting. Is there certain players that have to hit or that are more destined? Because, like, for instance, Dylan, he's a big dude, mm -hmm. so I expect him to clean somebody's clock. But, like, we've got guys, like, that are tiny mm -hmm. or smaller, like um, Cameron, kind of like he's, like, the medium size. Mm -hmm. So do you, like, if – is it two different – like, people or certain people hit – or do you expect everybody to hit? I expect everybody to hit. And it doesn't, like you said, we've got, you know, some smaller guys. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean, when I say hitting, it doesn't mean you got to put somebody in the, in the second row and put them through the glass. For me, it's just about separating separating whoever on their team has the puck from the puck. And um, I think, you know, over the course of the game, when you do those things consistently, whenever the other team gets the puck, they start to panic in the sense of where's the next guy coming from to hit me. And I think when we kind of are at our best is when we're physical on the forecheck and we can create a bunch of turnovers. But, yeah, I mean, I expect everybody to be physical. I mean, obviously, Sumalius is a pretty big dude, so um, his are a little bit louder um, than maybe, like, Chamelo's. But, um, you know, I, I expect guys like him and Timo to – battle hard on the puck and separate guys 
not necessarily you know knocking them down or, or putting them through the glass. Well, this is for Coach. I'm um, talking about the passing and the shooting. Um, we don't seem to have anybody with soft hands like Jake Trask. Are you working with someone? Or are we getting someone there that – that's got those soft hands because I think if we had that person, we'd get a lot more scores than what we're getting. Yeah, I mean, you're always looking. It's not like, unfortunately, guys like Jake Trask aren't sitting around not playing anywhere. So um, that's, you know, obviously the more guys with that kind of skill and talent and, you know, offensive instincts is always, you know, beneficial. Um, but that's what, I mean, you're always looking to improve your roster in any way you can. That's what I'm always doing. Um, and then you're just working with what you have and, you know, how do I assess what I have in this group and how do I construct a game plan that I feel like is going to give us the best chance to win. And, you know, sometimes I don't feel like we have necessarily the highest amount of skill in comparison to maybe like Fayetteville's forwards. So we have to play this style of game because we can't play a run-and-gun game with them. So, um, you know, obviously, again, like I said, I want – you're always looking for those type of guys. Um, but they're hard to find sometimes at this level. So, um, But I'll keep looking. I'd like to ask a positive question. So uh, the penalty kill has been really good since Christmas, uh, killing 21 of 24 penalties in that span. And I was curious to what you thought the biggest reason for the reliability of the penalty kill has been. Uh. Um, I think it's just the mentality and the confidence level that, you know, that we can kill it off. Um, I think I need to work on it again a little bit. I think the last few games has been a little sloppy in areas. And some of that is, you know, when I have – a certain amount of guys that I kind of trust and rely on to, to fit that role, and then they're either injured or called up or whatnot, then I have to filter other guys in, and, you know, maybe they don't get enough, you know, TLC in the sense that they're not as acclimated to it. So I think I need to practice it a bit, but I think it's more just, you know, the mentality of, um, you know, being aggressive in certain trigger situations like shots with rebounds or bobbled pucks or, you know, when we're, when we're aggressive, we're at our best and when we're passive, we're less so. So, um, you know, I'm obviously pleased with it. I don't like where, I don't know where we are sixth right now, fifth, fifth or sixth. Yeah. Like I, mm -hmm. that's not good enough for me. So, um, you know, I'm not going to be happy till we're, you know, top three. Watching, like, hockey clips and videos, you hear a lot of teams talk about enforcers. Do we have any enforcers on our team? Um, I mean, it's kind of uh, a fading role a little bit in hockey now. Um, I mean, I've got guys that are certainly willing to, to throw them and answer the bell. So, you know, I don't feel like we have one single guy. I mean, Urban will fight, Sumalitis will fight. Um, I mean, Timo's fought a goalie and a couple other guys. So, um, stripped him down. Yeah. So that's, I mean, for, you know, I, I think it used to be in this league where you kind of had a couple of those guys, and now the game's a little bit more skill skating based. So you really can't, I don't want to say waste a spot on yeah. a strict enforcer, but I've got, you know, guys that are flexible in the sense that, we have a few guys that'll that'll throw them. Do they have free reign to? Some guys, to just yes. Go at it? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's a timing thing. Like if somebody, one of your teammates gets cheap shotted, yeah. or you know, we're sluggish that night, and the guys need a, a bump, a jolt. Um, you know, I've got. That's just more instinct, kind of knowing the right times when to do it. Um, I'm never gonna tell somebody to to go fight or to not. It's yeah. just, also, um, on a night that maybe you're kind of just like, what else can I do? Do you have anybody that you can, like, just, like, say P-Rog and say, tell them just to get their heads out of their butt? I mean, do you have anybody that mean, can like stand up in between periods or something in the locker room, like when we're yeah, not playing? Like, yeah, like I somebody mean, that can just stand up and say, all right, guys, it's time to get our heads out of our butts and get out here and, and play the game. Right, yeah. No, I mean, I think I have multiple guys that are capable of that, and that's, again, that's more of a feel thing for yeah. them. I don't, I mean, um, I'm not like a yeller and screamer all the time. That's just not who I am <laughs> on a personal level. So, 
Um, I think Friday I got up there a little bit, um, but um, you know I have guys that have a good sense of you know when we're not at our best and when we can be a lot better, and you know they, you know that's just as much their locker room as it is you know yeah. mine. So, what do you do like, for instance? Um, the Birmingham and Huntsville game. I know we we hung around after the Huntsville game to see some of the guys, and they're, I mean, they're just they're beat. They're they don't they're blaming themselves. They're they're just they're wore out. They're beat down. Like, do you have somebody that can boost the morale too? Not just the, all right, let's go, let's get it. Do you have somebody that can can boost the morale of the team? Like, not necessarily during game play, but after everything's said and done, we're taking this four-hour road trip home and everybody's in their head about how crappy they played or but but still you got out there on a blade and skated your butt off and tried your best for people back home for yourself or whatever you're doing it for but to keep that that spirit up that no matter what if we're losing we're still giving everything we got yeah I mean uh, again, everybody's different. I think, you know, when I played, it was, um, for me, it was a lot of self-reflection. I demanded a lot of myself. I wasn't, you know, a rah-rah guy. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I do have guys that are a little bit more prone to being positive and, and uplifting. Um, I think a lot of that's, again, kind of down to the individual. I mean, I'm all about, you know, self-reflection after games. and. Right. No, and that's, I mean, that's obviously appreciated. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, after Saturday, you know, it's hard for guys to kind of go up there and have a smile on their face for the jersey auction after a game like that. But, um, you know, certainly at home when we have the post-game meals and you guys are, you know, checking in on how their family's doing or their girlfriend and, you know, just kind of that simple conversation that's maybe not hockey-related or, or whatnot, yeah, that's certainly, you know, helpful for them. All right, guys. Any other questions? <laughs> I didn't mean that to sound rude, I promise. All right, well, we... Uh, you know, sincerely, though, we do appreciate your participation. Um, this, is, this is what we want. We want you guys engaged. We want you guys asking questions. And, uh, you know, it's a testament to, to your faithfulness as fans. So we appreciate your, uh, your involvement tonight. Um, Coach, uh, I was going to ask you a couple of post, uh, post questions here, but uh, I think I'm just going to wrap it up with one. Um, there's some good news on the horizon coming up. Caleb Cameron was uh, activated off the injured reserve uh, today. Um, can you, uh, I guess talk about uh, how his progression has been through that 21-day uh, period in which he was on the IR, and, and how's it looking for him in terms of uh, suiting up this weekend? Um, good. I mean, he's been doing rehab and been diligent on that end of it and uh, skated um, yesterday, and I mean, he's a little sore today, but other than that, he, he felt good and he looked pretty good. So, um, you know, I don't know he'll be in the lineup this weekend. I don't know how limited or not his role is going to be, depending on how he's, he's feeling in the sense that, you know, he might be out there every third shift or he might be 10th forward and kind of mm. penalty kill and, you know, help me when I when I need some help. So, um, you know, it's kind of been, you know, long not having him, so I'm excited to have him back and uh, I think he'll, you know, positively impact our roster moving forward. Absolutely. And as he's proven, he's willing to do anything that it takes to help this team win, uh, even playing in different positions. So um, we're excited to have him back, and we're looking forward to this road weekend. As always, the last question I'm going to ask is to you as fans. We've got one last trivia question. Whoever can answer it correctly will earn an autographed puck from Dylan Denemy and from Evan Watts. The question is this. Uh, Dylan Denemy last season played in France. What French city did he play in? Bill, that's two weeks in a row, isn't it? Congratulations. <laughs> Can you tell me what country that it borders? Can you tell me what country it borders? That's just a bonus question. You've already won. <laughs> Do you know? 
What was it? You were right. Yeah, if you guys can find a way to cut the puck right down the middle, if you would, please do that. But uh, really appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Thanks so much, and feel free to uh, mingle. These guys aren't going to uh, miss the free meal at the end. So um, thanks again. We hope to see you next week. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah. Okay.